Okay, we're going to get started just to keep everything on time. My name is Brian Ezell, and I am the current chairman of the GMDC Global Market Development Committee for the Almond Board of California. And I'd like to welcome you all today as we look into superpowering almonds for the global future. As you heard a little bit yesterday in the State of the Industry Address from Brian and Richard, the um, world seems a little upside down right now. It's tough. Um, I don't know that I could have perceived five years ago the things that we'd be going through today, but um, we are. And so we can choose to be negative and uh, live in fear, or we can move forward um, and do what we can and stay positive. So hopefully today this presentation will show you that this group at ABC and this marketing committee are staying very positive and very excited. And you'll see that in the detail um, in the programs that they're going to share that we're working on. Uh, both domestically and uh, then in subsequent um, uh, presentations through the rest of the conference, you'll see what we're going to be doing in the different uh, export markets as well. So we've gone through supply, Mageddon. I, if it wasn't toilet paper, it's uh, shotgun shells. I'm a hunter, and the other day I was able to buy my first legal meaning what you're allowed to shoot to hunt waterfowl in eight months uh, just a few days ago. I felt like I lost, won the lottery. It was crazy. And um, because I literally, if that steel shot is not available, you don't get to hunt in California. So um, it's a little bit of everything. It's going to be real interesting as we go into this holiday period to see what the store shelves look like. Uh, but I think you guys have already seen Plenty of examples of aisles that are totally empty still. Then, of course, I think the bigger issue, and it's the one that's been impacting the almond industry the most this year, as well as, well as all ag commodities coming out of California, is this port issue. Uh, we started feeling the pains of it about a year ago, and um, we were impacted pretty greatly last January in our ability to ship. But I kind of felt like, uh, as an industry, we learned some tricks. And as you know, the rest of the year, we had record shipments month after month. And I think we kind of felt like, OK, you know, we know how to deal with this current issue. But as you've seen in the last two months, it's gotten much tougher. And the number of ships out at sea um, are much greater. And the finger pointing was originally against the shipping lines. Then they started pointing to the to the, the ports themselves. Now the ports are pointing to the truck drivers. Um, so anyhow, I don't know that there's any quick fix to this. And I'm hoping that uh, with a little more time, this will slowly improve. And then, of course, tariffs. Holy smoke. You know, it wasn't that long ago, back in 17, that we got the China tariff put on top of us. And we thought it was the end of the world. That was one of our, our key markets. People don't even talk about it anymore, even though it's still there uh, in, in the same matter that it is today. But it's funny how a new problem can help mask an old problem, even though it hasn't gone away. Um, but that's still a, a, a hindrance to our industry in getting um, growth in China like we used to see. And then, of course, being not only a grower farmer uh, at the company I work for, I fully uh, sympathize with the growers. If you're here in this room or here at this conference, because we've seen some pretty unprecedented increases in our input costs. Obviously, water during the drought is expected, but when you're looking at potash and nitrogen, PVC pipe double tripling uh, just from a year ago, it uh, makes the current circumstances, at least from an economics or a budget standpoint, that much tougher. And uh, so again, part of all the things that we talked about, but mainly the uh, supply chain issue at the ports. 
And then, of course, these, a lot of these things we personally aren't responsible for. We can't control and necessarily fix ourselves. But there are some things that have been challenges that, of, that are of our own doing. So I think you saw this yesterday. There's been a 37% increase in supply over the last couple of years. And uh, that's a challenge. I want you guys to understand if you look at the long-term history, you saw yesterday uh, um, a, a, sl a slide that said that the, the compound growth we've seen, I think it was since 14 or I can't remember the date, through 20 is 10%. But that includes crop year 2020. If you take 2020 out, the average growth rate is about six and a half, seven percent. And if you look historically, it's about six and a half, seven percent. So a number like this is going to be a challenge to any industry. And then how did we even get there? Well, we got there by we had good prices uh, in the past. Um, if you kind of look at the average price from 2012 to 2019, it's $2.84 to the grower. Some years higher, some years lower, that's the average. If we just looked at the average from 2016 to 19, it's 245. But then when you hit a number like this, last year it was $1.70. This industry is built for 6.5 to 7% growth year in, year out. And that's with the dollars that our assessment dollars go and all the hard work um, that's done here at the Almond Board to bring awareness um, and uh, to, to try to expose the world to almonds and the benefits of almonds. So anything above that six and seven and a half percent is going to have to be influenced by price. And that's what we saw last year. We're still dealing with it this year. So, um, you know, we used to average about 47,000 acres of plantings a year. Um, and since 2014, the average is 116,000 acres. So that's, again, it's a problem. I love growing just like everybody else does, but there are some consequences that come with that. And so here's a problem that as an industry, we have brought to the forefront. So we have to think long strategically how we adjust to this and Sigma and the continued drought may do it for us. And then of course, water uncertainty. Um, as of the October 21st, uh, we had in the, our major reservoirs 26% of capacity of water storage. Then we were blessed by a very large storm in uh, the 23rd through the 25th of October. And for some areas, it was a record rainfall in just a two-day period. But here we stand today, and that big wet storm that dumped seven to eight inches, some places 12 inches of rain, only moved our capacity up 5%. So we're at 31% capacity as of yesterday. So that is not over, but I will give you hope. We have a really nice looking storm coming next week. Um, the models are all over the place in terms of just how much they seem to fluctuate in every model run. But we're now close enough that there's some certainty that we're going to get some pretty decent rain next week. And the longer range models even show more as we head towards Christmas. So again, it's tough, but there's always hope um, in the horizon. So where do we go from here? What's the future look like? Well, a lot of these things, as I said, we cannot control. So we're going to focus on what we can control. And I can tell you at the Almond Board and at the Marketing Committee level, we are fully focused on what we can control. And when you think about the cost of everything and the fact that what we do with fairly flat um, budgets is amazing. And I think um, you're going to see what this team's put together, some new exciting things where we're not only targeting our normal uh, consumer audience, but we're also looking at uh, targeting millennials for the first time. So I guess before we get into this, I, my thoughts here are is just to stay positive, right? Because it's real easy not to stay positive in a, in a world where all the media wants to put fear and despair 
into our brains. So, but I'm just going to give you a couple of quotes. Uh, there's an old uh, Japanese proverb that says, fall seven times, stand up eight. Uh, Babe Ruth once quoted, every strike brings me closer to the next home run. And I think the bigger one that hit me as I was going through these is a quote by H. Jackson Brown. It says, in the confrontation between the stream and the rock, the stream always wins. Not through strength, but by perseverance. And I will tell you, that's our attitude at the Almond Board and this marketing committee. Uh, privilege to work with super intelligent, broad uh, representation of growers and handlers uh, on this committee who take what they do very seriously, who do not get compensated for it, but spend hours and hours and hours going through all the data and doing our best to spend grower money as wisely as possible and as effectively as possible. And I couldn't be more proud to be a part of this organization and we're more proud of Emily and her, her team. I guarantee you if, if I had my own company, I would be going after every one of them. Uh, that's just how good they are. So anyhow, so if we wanna, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily here in a minute, but just kind of reminder the strategic marketing objectives that we have at the Alma Board. One, we wanna build long-term worldwide demand for California almonds. Number two, create an environment which almond perceptions and almond brands thrive. Number three, address issues and seize opportunities that are best handled at an industry-wide level. And then, of course, do what we can to contribute to the financial well-being of the industry. But again, keep in mind, when supply and demand get out of balance, long-term, six and a half to seven percent. So anything above that is probably going to be something that we can't control. We're trying, but it's really hard in generic advertising, especially where we can't execute the end consumer consumption. So, but I'm excited to show you what we are doing and I'm going to turn it over to Emily. All right, well, thank you, Brian. It is so wonderful to be here after two years apart. I hope you're all so excited to be in person and live. I know I am. And we're here to talk about, I think, one of my favorite topics, and I'm guessing one of yours, almonds. Um, so as, you know, I'm gonna just drop things up here for a second, guys. So as Brian mentioned, there is a group of individuals called the Global Market Development Committee, and I just want to take a minute to talk about them. So I like to put their faces up here if you get the chance to meet and talk with them about some of the work they do. Um, these are the members and these are the alternates. But, you know, it really is the dedication of this group of individuals to bring together their perspective to help us shape both the markets that we're in the strat and the strategies that we have in the market. Um, it's a huge investment of time, and um, so I just want to call them out a little bit. And I also want to mention, um, you have a huge team behind you. Brian mentioned them. There's 15 of us that work on the global market development team, plus we have over 10 agencies around the globe. When we do global planning calls, we end up with over 100 people on the phone to kick off the year. Um, there's a huge army, and these are the six program leads that are on the team. Unfortunately, only half of them are here today, but I hope you do get to go to all the regional sessions we have. We tried to bring to life those who actually are not here in person um, in a fun, creative way. All right, so as Brian mentioned today, you know, things are pretty upside down. Um, and, you know, while staff, we don't live that day to day. And so we really can't completely understand exactly how it feels. We know it's painful. We know from talking to growers who are on our committee and handlers, we know from reading it in the newspaper, and we know what's even happening in our own lives um, on a lot of things and how that imp imp uh, affects the costs that our growers are, um, are facing. Um, and so we don't, we don't shy away from that, but we also don't focus on it because we know regardless of whether the crop is two and a half billion pounds or four billion pounds, we need to drive demand because at the end of the day, that's gonna be the key success for the industry. So, and I really want you to know that we really believe in the future of almonds. So they have a wealth of healthfulness 
product versatility that is endless and we're not backing down. So don't ever worry or think about that. And so what you're going to see in the marketing session today and what I hope you'll see if you go to the other regional sessions is just what we're doing to drive demand to ensure that this industry continues to thrive. So what does drive demand? You know, I often have discussions with industry members about let's just pour money into nutrition research or let's put all of our money into one market or different ideas like Super Bowl ads. And, and really what it comes down to is it's not just one thing. It's a combination of some really smart strategic decisions. So what we're going to show you today is kind of an overview of some elements of that. And Laurel and I, Laurel from Sterling Rice, will be up here in a minute to share some of that. But first, I want to talk to you about the markets we're in. So the first is choosing the right markets. Now, we've had presentations in the past that talk about the process we go through to do that. And hopefully some of you had a chance to see that. But at the end of the day, you know, the committee and staff look across an array of factors, whether it's population, current volume in the market, attitudes towards healthfulness, what we think the growth projections can be, and honestly, even how easy is it to reach consumers in that market, because certain markets are more complex and costly than others. And we take all that into account to choose the right markets. These are the 10 that we're currently focused on. Um, and we are, so it's the US, Mexico, four countries in Europe, UK, Mac, uh, UK, France, Germany, and Italy, and then in Asia, India, China, South Korea, and Japan. And so we work really hard to think about what are the right markets and, and how far can our dollars spread? How many markets can we be in where we're not diluting the dollars we have too much? We feel very strongly these are the right ones to be in right now, given many an array of different factors, but it also has to do with the balanced approach that we have, because we want to make sure that we're in markets that have varying dynamics, so that if one market happens to be falling, another one can be growing. Um, so you'll see, I'll talk about that here in a minute and some of the differences. So I'm going to highlight three of them. The first is India. So this market, as you've seen, has now become our, our number one export destination. Um, and if you talk to Siddharth in the Zoom Dart, who's the regional manager, he will be the first to tell you that the upside is almost feels endless. Um, it's a, a, almost a third of a pound per capita right now in that market. If you compare it to the US and Italy, which are over two pounds per capita, you know, just do the math. I mean, that would be exponential growth for the industry. So we're focused on leveraging the deep cultural connections that exist in that market, and we're increasing our investments. So this is now our second largest investment market that we have, and the um, dollars go a lot farther in India than they do in other markets, which, which works really well for us. So we've increased the actual spend of 80% over the past two years, which has resulted in impressions going up almost 80% as well. So tremendous increase, and we're also changing the touch points and the way we're reaching consumers in that market. Now I want to talk about the U.S., so completely different side of the coin. This is an $800 million market, so a huge gorilla, but it's very mature. So the growth rates we don't see or see in this market are going to look a lot different than what we see in some of our, our emerging markets and growing markets, but this is still really important because we need to both invest in the base to make sure that we don't lose the love of almonds that exist here, but also spur growth, because even though we're over two pounds per capita in this market, there's still upside to be had. So there's some things we're doing, though, in the U.S., and we're working on these across the globe, but because the U.S. offers some unique analytical tools, we can do it to an even greater level here. So one thing I wanted to share with you is the investment levels we have in the U.S., and so the black bars are the U.S., and then the white is everything outside of the U.S., and what you can see from this, this goes back all the way to 99, um, is that, you know, for about the ten, past 10 years, the investment level has stayed relatively flat. During the assessment increase, it bumped up, but we're at around the $16 million mark. But what really has changed is how we're shifting the way we reach consumers and how we're really pushing for efficiency, leveraging some tools that we have. So the, one of the things we've changed is our approach. So consumers have changed the way they live their lives. You guys have too. So we've shifted our media so that we're now 70% digital in this market. That sometimes can offer us really efficient ways to reach consumers too. So the cost per impression is a little bit less, sometimes not. But, but really the point is that we're shifting to where they are so that we're ensure that those impressions can do the hardest job they can. And then the next is a new marketing tool. 
So I won't bore you with all the details, but there's a tool that Nielsen, as I'm sure many of you have heard of AC Nielsen before, they do a lot of scan data in stores. They also have tons of analytical tools for companies like us to analyze how we can grow volume. One of them is called Marketing Mix. It basically takes your marketing plan and associates it with your spend in marketing and looks at sales in the grocery store and looks for correlations. And we've really started, we've started doing this the past two years and it's given us some great insights. So one is, you know, we ran a beauty campaign two years ago. We were able to see that that was one of the most efficient spends that we have. Uh, we're able to see how our TV, um, the pacing of our TV and the flighting, how it will work best. Some really important things to help us push those dollars even farther. And lastly, I'll talk about China. So this market is a, re a really interesting one. If you've been in the industry for a while, you may remember that at one point, we lost the name for almonds in China. Due to some regulatory changes, the name in Chinese actually, um, they said it would no longer represent almonds. So that's kind of a problem, because you can't market a product, and you can't actually import it if it doesn't have a name. So that took a hit on volume as they worked through that. Then there were also some issues with grade trade and trying to clean that up. There's just been blips in China. And certainly with the tariff um, being put in place a couple years ago, that has been another blip. But it's been so good to see that volume start to recover as uh, certain exemptions are made for the tariff. And hopefully at one point in time that will go away. What we're focused on is continuing to make an investment in that market because we know with 1.4 billion consumers, it's incredibly important. So a couple things I wanted to point out is one, we've been really pleased with what we've seen in terms of consumer perceptions in this market. So we have focused in three cities, Beijing, Guangzhou, and Shanghai. So the largest tier one cities in the market. And we've been focused there for quite a while. We've seen our perceptions grow. If we're now the number one nut associated with snacking, there's been a 20% increase in heavy users. And we're now the number one nut associated with beauty. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys all know, but beauty is the focus in all of our Eastern Asia markets. Um, and so to be not the number one nut associated with beauty is really meaningful, and it tells us our programs are working. But it is such a huge country, and no company, not Hershey's, any of the other major CPG companies, can afford to market across the country. And so you have to take an approach to kind of pick pieces of the market to market into. We have decided that we think we've built up enough awareness in the big three that we're gonna take a change. because we wanna to start to spread the news of almonds farther. So now we'll be adding three new cities, and Chongqing, Tianjin, and Hangzhou. There are three very different cities in different parts of the market. Two of them are near major metropolitan tier one cities. One of them is in a new province for us. Um, but what we're doing is we're going to start investing in these three. We'll keep Shanghai. We're going to pull back on Guangzhou and Beijing. We'll keep monitoring all the cities. If we need to make a shift, we will. But this is going to allow us to start building awareness where we need to, to reach more of those 1.4 billion consumers. So this map just kind of shows you where the cities are. The darker blue dots are where we'll be. Um, the population for China, it's important to note the country is vast. The population mostly sits towards the east. In this chart, you can see by the colors there, the density across the market. So it's a big change for us, but we're really excited. We've got a great team over in China helping us execute this and looking forward to tell you next year what we've learned. So lastly, the one thing I do want to also highlight is while we do have 10 markets and we believe they're the right ones, we're always looking beyond. So over the past year in the last committee meeting, uh, regions like the Middle East, uh, you know, and South America, Africa, even Russia, even though there's still the sanctions are still in place, come up in discussion and we debate, should we start peeling off some more money for a new market? What we decided is that South America is the market we think has the biggest long-term potential. Um, certainly incomes are at a lower level in that market, but we think over the long term they'll rise. Health uh, concerns and health interest is definitely on the rise. So we're starting to dip our toe in the water there. Do uh, some small consumer programs as well as more research this year to kind of understand um, what the future is and maybe build a program there in the near future. So now I want to shift a little bit and talk about why consumers love almonds and, and why, why they choose them at the end of the day. And really, with any food product, and I've worked in the food marketing industry for over 15 years, taste, food, convenience. Those are the three 
you bar, bars that you must achieve to have a product that consumers want. Any one of them it will do it, but if you have all three, it really can catapult the product. The issue is the definitions related to what consumers think is health, healthy, how their lives are changing, and what becomes convenience, it changes over time. So we have to change with it, as well as make sure that our touch points are reaching them in new ways. So Laurel's going to come up and share how we're doing that. Great, thanks Emily, and thanks for having us here today to talk about these really important topics for the industry and thinking about long-term value and demand. You know, when we talk about relevancy to the consumer, we're really gonna hit on three main points. First of all, health. Second, on sustainability, where it matters. And third, on attention. How do we make sure that we show up in new ways that grab consumers' attention. Let's dive in on health. If we all walked out of this building right now and we walked out into the street and we started each grabbing a consumer and we said, what do you think about almonds? They would instantly, no doubt, start talking about health benefits. And they would rattle off everything from good for managing my weight, good for my heart, good for digestion, good for diabetes, protein, fiber, energy, and so many more. They would probably also give us some benefits that maybe we're not even known for. Because health has been such a core part of almonds. This list right here represents the top benefits for almonds globally. We do a survey called Global Perceptions that looks at the perceptions of not only almonds, but all kinds of other nuts. And what we see is that across our 10 markets, that almonds own more benefits than any other nut at 15. As Emily mentioned, in markets like China, Japan, and also South Korea, we see beauty benefits rise to the top. In India, brain and mental acuity. And here in the US, heart health, weight management, and energy have been cornerstones of the program. But regardless of the market, we have to continue to expand these benefits that consumers put forward towards almonds in order to drive relevancy every single day. These health benefits not only help move almonds as a snack and the choices that we make with whole almond products, but they also help us really stand out with manufacturers in new products. There are a few things really more prized in consumer packaged goods marketing than what shows up on a label. And you can really see here, even though there's very limited space on each of these packages, that when almonds are included, so many health benefits are coming to the forefront as well whether it's antioxidants, plant-based, protein, fiber, no additives, sugar-free, versatile, and then calcium. These are all products from around the world in many of the key markets that we're in. And these are important because not only are almonds bringing these health attributes to the forefront, but it's also creating stronger loyalty between these products and almonds so that we're not just substituted out, that it's really creating a long-term connection with the product. But not only of, are the benefits of today important, but also the benefits of tomorrow. And that's why ABC, with the Nutrition Research Committee, is actively working on uncovering the next set of benefits. What can almonds be to our future consumers? And we see everything from athletic performance and physical performance in the areas of muscle mass and strength, additional work and more work in gut health and immunity. And then also, as you heard yesterday in the state of the industry and over the last couple years, the really exciting work that's been done with it, wrinkles and uh, the glow that Brian, our chairman, has but the additional opportunities that skin health and beauty can be in the future. 
But for consumers, it's not only how we talk about the benefits, but how we drive relevancy within the context. And you really can't open a publication or a website today without seeing this rise of wellness. And the definition of how we think about health, especially coming out of the pandemic, has really shifted. Now, when we talk about wellness, I don't want everybody to get scared. This is not Santa Cruz hippie wellness. Uh, but really rather a definition that expands to not only be about just specific conditions, but more about practicing healthy habits on a daily basis. And of course, consuming a handful of almonds fits perfectly in that. And this is not just about surviving, but really about how wellness can drive long-term thriving. We see in work uh, that was done by McKinsey and others that 79% of people globally, this is a global study of 7,500 consumers, that 79% believe wellness is one of the most important things. And 42% consider it a top priority. When you think about all the priorities in your life, it's really interesting to see how globally this trend and this movement is really moving forward. Wellness is defined across six key dimensions. And why this is important is that it's really opening up new opportunities for almonds to take our benefits and make them highly relevant to these dimensions that consumers are looking for. And we see how we are already starting to play this out in the US market. As Brian talked about, as well as Emily, we're really increasing our focus even more on millennials within the US market. And our messages over the last few years have focused so much on six grams of energy giving protein, knowing that our targets previously were really trying to fuel their days. And what we see now under these new trends around wellness is just such a broader opportunity for almonds to be relevant. Moving to a wellness platform allows us the opportunity to talk about immunity and balance, skin care, heart health, and more. And hopefully you'll all be able to attend the U.S.-Mexico presentation in this room later today to learn more. This strategy is already starting to play out in the media. And this is exciting because in the U.S., as Emily talked about, it's a very established market. And so we need to continue to get new news and new incremental gains to continue to push forward. Here in this article, Eat This, Not That, The Secret Effects of Eating Almonds, Says Science, really talking to some new news that's out there about almonds. So it's not just the status quo. We must continue to give whoops, um, consumers and customers more reasons to love almonds. The second area that we're going to dive into around relevancy is around sustainability. And even though sustainability is not a global communications platform, there are certain markets where sustainability really matters, and Europe is one of those. As the EU team will share tomorrow morning at 8.40, also in this room, now in the EU, sustainability and talking about sustainability is table stakes. We see on one side of the field that the legislative environment is one of the most complex and the most forward thinking in sustainability than anywhere in the world. Whether it's looking at the EU Green Deal, the Farm to Fork strategy, or the new EcoSource labeling that's coming on, we see that food manufacturers and retailers are highly, highly focused on sustainability, both in ingredients and in products. On the other hand, we see tremendous pressure from the media. I'm sure all of you remember Bees Going to War and other articles that really came to the forefront out of Europe, really targeting almonds in the past. And so because of that, 
We do have a reputation management program that's been kickstarted to complement the marketing efforts. These communications are focused on highly influential consumers who can tell our sustainability journey and eliminate questions and barriers to really protect the reasons on why to eat almonds. So finally, let's dive into the last area, attention. I'm actually pleasantly surprised as we've been sitting here. I haven't seen a lot of people on their phones, but we know we have to compete at all times with all of our devices. We are attention-starved and tech-driven in every single part of our lives. I'm thrilled that my watch hasn't been like buzzing me with, you know, my children trying to talk to their friends or, or texting someone else. So when we're talking about intention, we know that one of the most important things, probably the most important thing that we can do is grab people's attention. Because if we don't, we can't tell them why they should eat almonds, and we can't ask them to buy. So we have to make sure that our messages show up in the right places where we can grab that attention. And ABC has been highly focused through GMDC, as Brian had mentioned, on making sure we're showing up in the right ways with the right messages to do so. When we look at the changes over time, because all of you probably are sitting here now wanting to grab your phone, uh, we know that mobile usage has been up 460% in terms of where our attention is over the last 10 years. And even in the last year, the pandemic really supercharged these changes. We saw here in the US that 47%, 47%, of consumers cut the cord, letting go of their cable providers and switching to mobile and streaming services. And it's been a huge jump when you think about all the streaming services that you may now have at home and how it feels like every single week there's another network or another media property releasing another streaming service. Similarly, e-commerce made 10 years of advancements in just a couple months as consumers continue to find more reasons to just go online, research, and purchase. And this has driven our continued push from shopping in aisles to shopping through apps, which is a huge opportunity for the future. As Emily had shared, the U.S. has been on a huge progression of really shifting to a very digital-focused program. But we see that this is true across the globe as well. When you look at the transition of the same time period in China, for an example, 13, uh, 14, 30% digital, now today 100%. EU, 51% digital in 1516, now 95%. And also in India, which is really an evolving now uh, digital market coming online and coming of age, we see that the programs this year in the budget ABC is spending is pushing 17% percent uh, digital. And one of the things we're really excited about as we move into this new year, in just a couple weeks, a brand new digital campaign is going to start in India. And it's focused on a younger target audience with a beauty message. We see that by diving in to these really highly targeted micro campaigns on digital, it allows us to be very, very highly effective in delivering messages. And we've seen that across other markets, specifically here in the U.S., when we launched the Wrinkle Study, and then also um, in Europe as well. So we're just thrilled with the new work that's going to be coming out in India in just two weeks. Another way that we reach consumers is by association. These associations can be highly powerful. ABC has done uh, partnerships with athletes like the Women's World Cup with Julie Ertz um, to Olympic volleyball player, if you remember from the 2019 conference, uh, Carrie Walsh Jennings being here with us, 
to superstar actresses um, like Barbara de Raheel in Mexico and Soha Ali Khan, this year a Bollywood star and has a very famous husband um, in India. And even work that we've done in the past, um, even last year with the draft for the NFL. These partnerships really help extend our message in new ways. ABC is also leveraged and continues to leverage in every single market, health influencers, and then also smaller social media influencers as well to get our market, to get our messages out. And we see how powerful these partnerships can be in driving almond associations, as well as how they can really help create new relevancy, new trust, and new credibility. All right, so there's one last thing we want to talk about, about why we're bullish about almonds in the future. And, you know, it is so rare to have an ingredient that honestly is in so many categories. If you walk into a U.S. grocery store, you will see almonds in every, every, every aisle. And what's unique about that, because you'll certainly find corn, corn and soy in every aisle, is that we're often called out on the front of pack. And as a former brand manager, I know how precious that space is on the front of your package. You're not willing to give that up unless it's really meaningful to consumers. So we know that almonds carry such cachet, and we're excited about where things are headed. So plant-based is what I have up here. You know, this is currently a $30 billion global category, according to Bloomberg Intelligence. I'm sure there's many estimates out there. But they think this can grow to $164 billion in a decade. That's huge. And it's many categories. This really is a mega category. But we think almonds can play really well. Now, we tend to be a little bit more expensive of an ingredient compared to some of the alternatives. But like I said, that front of pack credibility and the fact that manufacturers can call that out to consumers is really important. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the industry creates. This certainly isn't where the almond board plays. But uh, obviously, we watch it and monitor it and where we can help fuel it. You know, milk. Milk has definitely become a much more mature category in Western markets. But, you know, we travel the world. Well, we used to travel the world. We will again soon. Um, and we see that milk really still is underdeveloped in many markets and exciting to see new products continue to come. And we're starting to see other things like blends um, showing up in those markets as well. And the new categories keep coming. So you've probably seen the um, almond tortillas at the grocery store here in California. They have fairly good distribution. Um, but there's a butter that's out. So not an not a almond butter replacement for like a peanut butter. This is like a butter um, that works out from Kite Hill. I still have not tried it, but I'm looking forward to. Um, chips, probiotic products, um, hard cheeses. So typically almonds have been in more of a soft cheese, and now we're starting to see things that look more like a cheese you could actually shred. Um, so super interesting. Excited where that's going to head. And then beauty products. And so in, when I travel, I've seen that India, and in some cases South America, you see almond oil being used in beauty products already. It hadn't been that common in the U.S., but we're starting to see more and more of it here. And it's really exciting because those categories are huge. It's hundred and um, almost $130 billion for skin care and $70 billion for hair care. So if almonds can just take a piece of that, that's meaningful growth for the industry. So there's one other thing I want to talk about that we've been talking all about the kernel, but really what we want to do is maximize everything that's coming out of that orchard. And as you know, the kernel's only a portion of it. There's the hull, the shell, and the woody biomass when the tree's end of life comes. And a new, new innovation has become, hopefully some of you tried this beer. If not, I think there's still opportunities too. Um, it was developed out of the leadership program. A small innovation in terms of the volume it can consume, but still really exciting to see where you can take things. And there are projects that the Almond Board has underway looking at what we can do with these essentially byproducts and how we can upscale them. So there's a presentation tomorrow I would encourage you to, to go to if you're interested in this. They're looking at things like different types of animal feeds. Certainly um, dairy is already part of it, but looking at an array of animals. Um, nutrition bars, cosmetics, uh, activated carbon, which is a water filtration, the carbon that's used in water filtration systems, and then carbon black, which is a, a filler for plastics. Really exciting stuff, because we want to maximize everything. 
Um, so with that, you know, I wanted to kind of go back to this whole theme that we brought in today of superpowering almonds. And, you know, certainly we threw that in because it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek play with our new superhero partners. But it's, it's also more than that because we know this industry is facing a lot of challenges right now. But we want you to know that California almonds have its own superpowers, both as a product and with the industry. So the first is how we improve people's lives. So through health and wellness, um, we are front and center, and it has never been more important. Second is that we're globally relevant. We have substantial volume and volume potential across so many markets, and this is critical because when some markets get challenged, we need the other ones to help, help lift us up. And, and we have the ability to drive the relevance in those markets to grow them. Next is the nature of our product. So it can be used in so many things. Uh, snacks, beverages, it can be creamy or crunchy. It can be sweet, be sweet or savory because it just blends so well with many flavors. And we just fit how people eat and how they live. And I think we'll continue to given this endless innovation that I think is before us. And the lastly is the industry. And I uh, joined this industry about six years ago, or joined this team about six years ago, and had the pleasure of working with the industry. Um, and I've just been so impressed how this industry consistently has made strategically sound decisions for the betterment of the future. And you know, it's full of really smart, savvy, curious individuals who are willing to put their time in to help figure this out. And it's often not easy. And I hear stories of times in the past when there were really difficult decisions ahead and, and they were made. And so that's, I think, also a huge superpower that we cannot um, discount. So with that, just four things I want you to keep in mind that we are doing. Um, so we're going to leverage all those superpowers as we move forward because that is critical. Next is, you know, we're continuing to refine our marketing strategies um, across the globe because um, we want to drive new growth. Geographic expansion is on our horizon and we want to continue to look for where and when we do that. And then lastly is just continuing to push that relevancy in any and every way that we can. So. With that, I want to play a little video that just gives a highlight of what's happening uh, this year in each of the markets. Or maybe I don't. So I'll tell you to go to the other four sessions um, <laughs> that are happening, um, one in, all in this room, one this afternoon, and then um, three more tomorrow. So do we have the video? Is it maybe after this? OK, we don't have the video. Well, it was a really good video, guys. <laughs> oh, that's a, do you pay me for that? <laughs> same, same salary you get, right? Yes. All right, well, uh, the last thing I want to tell you about is it's really important to us that you leave conference knowing a little bit more about our marketing programs. Because, you know, honestly, we don't market to most of you because guess what? You're already eating almonds. So you don't get the benefit of seeing the work that we're doing very often. And so we put this little quiz together. There is a prize if you fill it out and get the answers right and you take it to the ABC booth. The first 20 people get a Thor Ragnarok poster and all the growers who enter will be put into a raffle to win a very Thor themed out uh, prize basket. So, and you can get the answers by reading the almanac, coming to sessions, hunting down some of the global market development team or the committee members. And with that, I will say thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Brian so we can you know, take your questions. Thank you, Emily and Laurel. And, um, the Marvel team. We appreciate you uh, partnership and, and you coming to our conference. Um, we know that you're busy. So I guess I'd like to open up to any questions that maybe were not answered. Just remember there are more deep dive sessions into, into specific markets as we uh, go through rest of today and um, uh, Thursday. So um, um, anyhow, but let's, if there's any questions we can answer, there are some mics up here. If you just want to walk up to the mic and we'll try our best to answer those. Yeah, no, I just had a question. You were explaining that you were considering new markets and one, I, I'm sorry, I just didn't hear which market you were referring to. So South America. South America is the one that we're starting to look at, but we okay. continue to look at all of them. I, I may have mentioned we looked at Middle East, uh -huh. we're talking about Africa a little bit, okay. continue to watch Russia. But oh, but so, South Africa. South Africa. Yeah. South Africa. Or so, I'm sorry, South America. South America, all right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That'd be bad. 
That'd be a very different market. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, I'm going to, before um, we go into uh, the schedule for the rest of the day, um, I would like to say that uh, I appreciate all your time and attention for coming to our session. About three weeks ago, I decided to try to get the end of fishing season over in the Sierras, and I uh, was just driving up the, the 395 there and stopped there at Alantia. And I don't know if you guys have, everybody stopped on 395 at Alantia. It's kind of the first series, and as you go a little further Independence, that's where kind of the Whitney portal is. So these are the highest mountains in uh, North America, at least um, uh, outside of Alaska. And I stood there in front of some old abandoned houses. And this was <laughs> right after the word Omnicrom came out, and I'm just so I had, you know, as you know, when you take that drive, it's a long, quiet drive, <laughs> and uh, you're staring at desert, and I get there, and, and I pulled over right there, and I stared at these abandoned houses, and I stared up at these mountains, and it, it reminded me kind of how I've been feeling this last year, that, wow, that's, how do you, how did our forefathers even in the 1800s that were traveling west for better opportunities, what did they think when they finally reached that? If you think about them, they had to come from the west or from the east to the west. They had to traverse rivers of tariffs themselves, but they were real rivers. They had to take on um, disease, bad weather, mountain ranges that seemed ominous. And then they probably got out there to that flatter desert and thought, okay, it's finally a little easy. It's a little hot, but it's pretty easy selling. <laughs> and then they come up to that mountain and go, are you kidding me? How are we going to get these wagons, trains, and horses, and my kids, and my wives, and all these possessions over that? But then it hit me that the reason these houses were abandoned is because they didn't give up. Despite the struggles that each one at the time seemed overwhelming, and now they're facing this major one like nothing they'd ever seen, because there's no mountain ranges like this further east, they said, I'm not going to settle for right here where it's dry and where the wind blows crazy all the time. And even though it's kind of pretty to look at those mountains, this isn't it. So they went north and they went south to look for passes and they finally made it over the valley and they're the reasons why we're able to farm almonds today and build dams and infrastructure to allow us to grow the way we have. So I know this has been a tough couple of years, but keep moving, keep moving forward, stay positive. We are definitely staying positive because we couldn't be more excited and, uh, you know, I'm in the pistachio business as well as the almond business, but when you look at the number of products that almonds are in compared to any other nut, you have a real reason to have great hope. Yes? That being said, I would love to see that video that Emily was talking about. Could yeah. you see what's next? Yeah, do we have, have it ready? <laughs> Let's do it. Oh, I got to click. Oh, I didn't screw
What? <laughs> what happened? It almost oh, played. There's right. one last piece that may have you paid tribute to Thor at the end. So he's come home. Maybe you can that. show it just at one of the other sessions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, can, you want to do that? Don't ask me to act. All right. I think that would be appropriate. <laughs> okay. Before you leave, there's some important announcements for you all. So please hang tight. So for those that have purchased a meal ticket for lunch today, uh, after you leave here, you should be starting to make your way over to uh, Ballroom A, where the lunch will be. And we'll have the special guest speaker, Barb Stuckey, of uh, the Innovation and Marketing Officer for M Matson, And that's sponsored by Yosemite Farm Credit. Um, we are finishing a little early, so you have some extra time here. Don't feel like you have to run. Uh, following lunch, there will be dedicated trade show down below, just like it's been going. And there's more than, as you know, 270 different exhibitors. Also during this time, um, you can visit the dedicated poster session, which is in Hall A, and it's a great opportunity to dig into the ABC-funded research and chat with those brilliant minds behind the research. Um, and then the next set of presentations this afternoon will begin at 2.45, so rootstock selection as a tool to address soil challenges and major pests and diseases is going to be in room B4. Almond Wellness in the U.S. and Mexico, a new opportunity here in B7, and Ag Export Delays, any light at the end of the tunnel will be in B10. With that, thank you for your attendance. Have a good rest of your show.